Good afternoon. Welcome to the third and final installment of the 2015 Toni Morrison Lecture, sponsored jointly by the Center for African American Studies and Princeton University Press. My name is Josh Gild. I'm an associate professor of African American history. It's my great pleasure to introduce once more our esteemed speaker, Robin D.G. Kelly, distinguished professor of history and the Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair of United States History at UCLA. Professor Kelly is a social and cultural historian whose research interests transgress geographical boundaries and disciplinary borders. His tremendous body of work spans the United States, Africa, and its vast diaspora, engages social movements, popular culture, political economy, urban life, intellectual currents, artistic production, and historical theory. He is a prolific scholar. As author or co-author, Professor Kelly has published seven books and has helped to edit four more collections. His scholarly work has appeared in a startling array of professional venues, including most of the top journals in his field and many of the leading outlets in adjacent areas of inquiry. At the same time, though, Professor Kelly is a public intellectual in the truest sense of that term, not one driven by market considerations, a quest for notoriety, or a desire to build his brand. Rather, Robin Kelly is someone committed to sharing his work widely with diverse audiences and to exchanging ideas with organizers, activists, people of conscience everywhere, eager to learn about the past in order to better understand the present. He has published essays in places like the New York Times, The Nation, and The Crisis. And it is no surprise, therefore, that his writings have been taken up by and read by uh, community groups, labor organizations, local history collectives, and those locked away in iron cages. Professor, Professor Kelly's stature in the profession rests not only, though, on his scholarship. He is a truly beloved figure whose, hum, whose humility is exceeded only by his kindness and his generosity, his legendary generosity as a teacher, as a mentor, as an advisor, as a colleague, and as a reader. His generosity manifests itself in so many ways, um, and, but in part I want to draw attention to the, to the way he unapologetically acknowledges his intellectual debts in his work. Um, intellectual debts that, raise, that, that range from Cedric Robinson and C.L.R. James to Stuart Hall and Angela Davis to Parliament Funkadelic and Jane Cortez. Uh, Robin, it'd be too much for me to say that I became a historian because of Robin Kelly, but Robin Kelly is absolutely the historian I've always as aspired to be. He has trained and influenced a generation, now two generations of scholars, whose work collectively has transformed and is continuing to transform the academy. For those of you who watched or listened to Professor Kelly's first two lectures, but who are perhaps less familiar with his work beforehand, you may have been struck by the sheer breadth of his canvas, the multiplicity of associations and connections, the movements across time and space. But it's important that we note that Professor Kelly's intellectual and political orientation has always been global. His professional training began in African history, and indeed his original conception for his dissertation was as a comparative study between uh, leftist radicalism in South Africa and in the U.S. South. But as he no explains in an interview with Dr. Jordan Camp, our CAST postdoctoral fellow, Conducted on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the publication of his first book, uh, Professor Kelly was denied access to apartheid era, era South Africa and therefore um, uh, reoriented the project around, uh, around something else, a different, different set of concerns. It became instead an examination of the encounter between bl bl black working class people and communist organizers in Depression era Alabama. Published as Hammer and Ho, it is at once a sobering and a hopeful rumination on the complex dynamics of multiracial movement building in the face of vicious repression. And I think it's this balance between the difficult and the foreboding, between and the inspiring and the optimistic, which is, I think, a really a central feature of Professor Kelly's work. Uh, and it's something that we find, uh, I think, most, um, most fully articulated in his 2002 book, Freedom Dreams, where he talks in the very opening, in the preface, uh, about the ways in which we come to measure the success of social movements. He says, by, by, most, by most measures, most of the progressive social movements that we look at uh, are failures. Right? And they fail because of the incredible odds against which they, that they face. Um, but he, he, he implores us there and throughout the text and throughout his body of work 
to look instead at the merits and the power of the visions themselves, right? The ideas that organizers had, that working people had, that everyday people had to imagine a different future. He goes on in Freedom Dreams to write, progressive social movements do not simply produce statistics and narratives of oppression. Rather, the best ones do what great poetry always does, transport us to another place, compel us to relive horrors, and more importantly, enable us to imagine a new society. So I want to turn very briefly to a piece of poetic knowledge, uh, another reference point in Professor Kelly's work and the work, is the work of M.A. Césaire, the great Martinican poet and activist. And in his 1956 epic, Return to My Native Land, Césaire writes, unexpectedly on their feet, on their feet in the holds, on their feet in the cabins, on their feet on deck, on their feet in the wind, on their feet beneath the sun, on their feet in blood, on their feet and free, on their feet and in no way distraught, free at sea and owning nothing, veering and utterly adrift, surprisingly on their feet, on their feet in the rigging, on their feet at the helm, on their feet at the compass, on their feet before the map, on their feet beneath the stars, on their feet and free. My wife and I embarked on a grand medical adventure a few years ago. I remember fondly volunteering in hospitals together, then studying for the MCAT together, then packing our car up to its roof and driving from Pennsylvania to Florida full of hope together. First we went to Gainesville, where I lived for many excellent mentors. I met a family doctor for Dr. Brendan Blalock, and for years I'll be asking myself, what would Dr. B do? One time the man was very upset in reception. Dr. B went out there and got yelled at for a full five minutes. Afterwards, he spoke briefly with the receptionist, then was back to being his usual upbeat self. He was going to make sure he gave his best for his patients and for me the rest of the afternoon. I also got a position as a pharmacogenetics research assistant. What an exciting field that was. It was a to learn alongside. Uh, Is it part of the performance? No. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to, I'm going to have to ask you. Um, do, do, you need some, do you need money? Is it just money? something I need to finish. Okay. I apologize. I don't want to get Excuse me. Please. Yeah, brother. I played soccer with a motley crew that included Europe undergrad, grad students, med students. Okay, excuse me. And, uh, I thought I was about to go. Immigrants from West Africa. The immigrants complimented me by saying, I played soccer like someone who's not born in the United States. I'll be peaceful. I'm trying to next to Miami, please. My wife and I had a good fortune to be accepted by the Miller School of Medicine. Didn't see that one coming. I actually want to go back to the poem. I, I think it's actually really important for 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 setting up a little bit of where Professor Kelly is going to take us and where we've been over the last two days. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to return to the top. Back to Césaire, 1956. Unexpectedly on their feet. On their feet in the hold, on their feet in the cabins, on their feet on deck. On their feet in the wind, on their feet beneath the sun, on their feet in blood, on their feet and free. On their feet and in no way distraught, free at sea and owning nothing, veering and utterly adrift, surprisingly on their feet. On their feet in the rigging, on their feet at the helm, on their feet at the compass, on their feet before the map, on, the, on their feet beneath the stars, on their feet and free as the cleansed ship advances fearless, fearless upon the caving waters. If we think about where Professor Kelly took us yesterday, about the global, right, about the creation of the immigrants as a category, right, and about the, the modes of resistance both uh, on Monday's lecture and uh, in yesterday's lecture, and I believe in today's part three, we might think about that image, right, we might think about that image on the ship. Um, part three of this lecture Ending war, decolonial democracy against neoliberalism, 
signals to us as the as its predecessors have futures that have been foreclosed and what it, what it means to re reimagine those futures what it means to go back and do this work of historical excavation that professor kelly has done but to think always creatively and imaginatively uh, and and i want to end finally with a quote from our own Toni Morrison from Song of Solomon, again on this issue of imagination, right, of dreaming better futures. In Song of Solomon, Ms. Morrison writes, if you, sur if you surrender to the air, you could ride it. Hmm. Robin Kelly. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually thought that dude was part of the performance. That's why I didn't do anything. So I thought, you know, you're reading Césaire and he's about to do a dance and I'm all like, I'm like, wow, you all went all out. <laughs> you know, but, but it turned out not to be the case. Um, and also let me begin two things. One, um, I have to acknowledge my man Josh here, who I first met when we were trying to recruit him to graduate school at NYU. And we lost that one in some respects, but I remember saying to myself, that dude's gonna be so famous, I just hope he doesn't forget me, you know? <laughs> and I'm glad you didn't forget me. He made a great choice of Yale, and you know, I, I remember, he'll, he'll vouch for this, my, my whole thing always when I talk to potential graduate, grad students is, you know, um, you make the best decision, I don't work for a corporation, you know, I'm not part of a team, you know, we're part of it, the collective universe of making new knowledge. And so I was happy when he went to Yale, missed him, but then got the pleasure of being able to read that astounding manuscript. When that book comes out, you'll be crying. You'll, you'll sort of start to realize what transnational actually means. So I'm very excited about that. Um, okay, also the second thing I want to say before I begin, uh, besides the fact that I'm so tired, oh my God. <laughs> Because um, I've been up, I've been up since five trying to work on this talk, like every talk. Because like I told you yesterday, I came here with a lot of ideas, um, but not clear on how to operationalize them. I had to remind myself at 5 a.m. that my task is not to write the history of the world. So I feel like I've been doing that. Um, but to go back to the original project, and that is this sort of political and historical autopsy of Mike Brown's body. Um, and so I'm gonna come back to that, though I'm still gonna go around the globe a little bit. I'm gonna come back to that in the end. Um, okay, let's just put that. And I'll let you read that as we, we begin, okay? <clears throat> now, a lot of you will recall uh, the eruption of protests that occurred uh, in the wake of Mike Brown's murder uh, actually displaced um, the is Israel's war on Gaza in the 24-hour news cycle. Now to be clear, it wasn't Brown's death that was newsworthy. It was the riots that followed, the quote-unquote riots. And it wasn't the mere existence of protesters that made Ferguson an international story. It was the fact that the people who took to took to the streets, faced down um, police in riot gear, rubber bullets, armored personnel carriers, semi-automatic weapons, and a dehumanizing policy designed to contain and silence. But to the world at large, um, Ferguson looked like a war zone, okay? Because the police looked like the military. Okay? For black residents of Ferguson and St. Louis proper, in ghetto communities across the country, it was already a war zone. I mean, hence Mike Brown's and Dorian Johnson's initial trepidation toward the police. But then suddenly critics and pundits who really never gave a damn about, you know, the killing of black and brown people by the police were indignant about the hardware, you know, about the AR-15s, the arm, arm uh, personnel carriers, the helmets and the flak jackets. Okay. Now, one need not to work so hard, especially when you're watching the events in Gaza unfold, uh, to draw a connection between Israeli state violence in the name of security in the US, from drone strikes abroad to domestic police killings. The activists seized the moment 
pointing to the role uh, Israeli companies and security forces have played in arming and training U.S. police departments and issuing solidarity statements about Ferguson and also solidarity statements about the NYP, uh, NYPD killing of Eric Garner, including advice on how best to deal with tear gas. Now, by recognizing the U.S. and Israeli security states not as exceptional, but as part of a global neoliberal racial regime firmly rooted in the history of settler colonialism, uh, we begin to see some revealing parallels in relationships. We should always bear in mind that Operations Defensive Shield, Determined Path, Autumn Clouds, Summer Rains, Cast Lead, Returning Echo, Protective Edge, Brother's Keeper, or whatever euphemism du jour are not exceptional episodes, but the rule. Okay. Like Operation Ghetto Storm or Brazil's pacifying police units waging war on poor black favela residents, the consequences for the ruled ought not be measured merely by the destructive force of American-made F-15s, cluster bombs, and white phosphorus, but also by the everyday routine of occupation, unemployment, poverty, insecurity, precarity, illegal settlements, state-sanctioned state theft of water and land, destruction of local economies and agriculture, a racially defined security regime, the effects of permanent refugee status. Now, in our lexicon, cops and soldiers are often heroes. Let's see, I'm going to jump to this picture. Okay. Um, and what they do is always framed as security. You know, there was this acts of self-defense. The police are on the streets to protect and to serve citizens, black and brown, from black and brown criminals out of control. Sorry. And this is why every, in every instance, the victim is depicted as assailant. For people who live under occupation, they experience the world as victims of perpetual war. And as a consequence of perpetual war, in which virtually all civilians are deemed combatants, collective punishment is the fabric of everyday life. In Mike Brown's hometown, it takes the form of routine stops, fines for noise ordinance violations, like playing loud music, fair hopping on St. Louis's light rail system, uncut grass or unkempt property, trespassing, wearing saggy pants, expired driver's license or re registration, disturbing the peace, or merely walking in the middle of the street. Now, if these fines or tickets are not paid, it may result in jail time or paying an inordinate sum to a bail bondsman or losing one's car or other property or possibly losing one's child to social services. Now, of course, none of this is about crime. It's about criminalization or what Lisa Cacho identifies as the racial state's use of law to create a permanent condition of rightlessness. And she writes, to be stereotyped as a criminal is to be misrecognized as someone who committed a crime, but to be criminalized is to be prevented from being law-abiding. Okay. In other words, decriminalized blackness exists as a state of exception, the unfortunate victims of misrecognition. Um, by portraying Mike, the Mike Browns and the Trayvon Martins of the world as the unde undeserving dead, by rendering them good kids, college-bound, honor students, sweet, as if their character is the only evidence they have of their innocence, you know? Um, criminalization of blackness like that of the illegal alien means being subjected to state regulation, containment, discipline and punishment, but it also means uh, not being worthy of protection and thus ineligible for personhood. Consistent with the condition of coloniality, black people are almost always made to pay for the very system that renders them non-persons. Okay? So as we learned way before the Justice Department issued its report on Ferguson, summons and warrants uh, are used as a kind of racial tax an extraction of surplus directly by the state without producing anything besides discipline and terror and the reproduction of the state. In other words, revenue by primitive accumulation. 
In 2013, Ferguson's municipal court issued nearly 33,000 arrest warrants to a population of just over 21,000, generating about $2.6 million in income for the municipality. That same year, the St. Louis County and City Municipal Courts acquired more than $61 million in fines and fees, accounting for almost half of all fines and fees collected by the municipal courts throughout the whole state of Missouri. The top 21 collectors were municipalities that generated at least one-third of their revenue from court fines and fees, and where on average 62% of the residents were black and 22% lived below the poverty line. And yet, the threat of state violence is almost always displaced by citing black and black homicides, black men wearing their pants too low, or black women being too sexually promiscuous. It's a classic bait and switch move that forecloses a deeper interrogation of how neoliberal policies are a form of state violence. The dismantling of the welfare state, promoting capital flight, divestment of public schools, hospitals, housing, transit, increased investment in police and prisons and privatizing public resources, and the list goes on. In fact, we could also talk about environmental and health hazards, poverty, and alternative economies are rooted in violence and subjugation. And alternative economies rooted in violence and subjugation is kind of interesting because one thing I never actually acknowledge, but is a central part of my own thesis, is that war begats war that there are wars that are produced as a result of this war internally, within, among the colonized. And those wars are violent and destructive, and they have to be considered in the whole frame of things. Now this is the world uh, Mike Brown and his generation and his parents' generation inherited. This is not the world the people who faced down Alabama state troopers in Selma 50 years ago had envisioned. I deliberately mention Selma because in our current giddy commemoration of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, in the sense of liberal panic at its repeal, we miss the fact that Selma masked a defeat. Liberalism won, but decolonization lost. At the very moment when a, the, a, a multiracial democracy based on the universal franchise is actually achieved, the U.S. expands its empire, and the neoliberal order is ascendant. It wasn't immediate or recognizable at first, and if anything, what appeared to be the success of thoroughbred liberation movements and urban insurrections fueled alternative radical movements in the 1970s, but they could not defeat neoliberalism. Now here, um, Nikhil Singh's brilliant forthcoming book, Exceptional Empire, Race and War in U.S. Globalism, is instructive. He shows how a liberal, triumphalist discourse of American exceptionalism camouflages the racist, settler colonial roots of the U.S. national security state. What makes the U.S. exceptional is its ability to overcome racial divisions and build a functioning multiracial democracy on the foundations of a free market economy. The triumph of civil rights was not only used to morally justify its global wars by treating U.S. foreign policy as an expression of its democratic creed, but in doing so, it stripped the black freedom movement of its radical demand to overturn the country's racist uh, foundations, reducing the movement's goals to winning basic rights and state compliance with federal law. So the result is post-civil rights. It's a, it's a weird word, post-civil rights. I mean, the post is universally accepted to mean after. And by that, we talk about after the victory of the civil rights movement, whose achievements are tangible and indisputable. And that is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, sometimes the Housing Act, uh, Act of 1968. And in this post-civil rights age of colorblindness, we're told a story about an active federal government, conscience pricked by World War II and black activists on the ground, that moves to finally eliminate the barrier of segregation. And in, actually, even this formulation has gone through some changes um, in which the movement is playing a smaller and smaller role, and the state or the politicians are elevated as the heroes. You know, I mean, if you don't believe me, see the play all the way about LBJ. 
I mean, it's all about how LBJ single-handedly, despite um, uh, Dr. King, you know, who's in the background uh, coveting the white woman in the office, uh, despite him, he was able to get this through. And so much of the backlash against Ava DuVernay's film is about that, pushing back against that, that discourse. In any case, the moral of the story, as we all know, is that black people can only blame themselves for their problems. This version of the movement's history ignores like several generative issues. One, white supremacy's violent subjugation of black people, which was really the heart of the matter. Two, disfranchisement or taxation without representation. Three, a racial economy which suppressed black wages, dispossessed people from land and property, and denied access to public services and accommodations that ultimately served to subsidize white privilege by way of black consumers and taxpayers. Violence in this instance propelled more black people to the movement than an abstract desire for integration. Okay? So you ask most people, what brought you to the movement? Mur the murder of Edmund Till you know, had much more of an impact than Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the bombing of black homes all over the region, notably Birmingham, where clearly conservatives did not respect the sanctity of private property. Because <laughs> no matter what they say, you know. Omitted from, I think, Ava DuVernay's otherwise excellent film was the fact that the Selma marchers uh, plan to carry Jimmy Lee Jackson's body to the state house to implicate Governor Wallace in, the mur in his murder. So state violence, in fact, was the burning issue, not just the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Now, by recasting the movement as merely a demand for integration, inclusion, and equal opportunity, uh, the, the effect, there's the four things that happen as, real, as a result of this. Um, one, it renders civil rights as past. You know, so if you talk about like, what's the new civil rights? As if the old civil rights issues have been resolved, <laughs> which is funny to me. Um, two, it limits its scope to basic equality or equality of opportunity under the law that is equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Three, it ignores the persistent problem of racist violence, especially state-sanctioned violence. And four, it obscures the fact that multiracial movements to democratize America actually started out as resistance to expanding the, the expanding national security state in U.S. imperialism. So you think about like the anti-war movement and free speech movements. That those, those were like some of the main issues that people were fighting around. So with the time I have left, I want to quickly walk us through the history of U.S. triumphalism, um, or rather, I say the history that U.S. triumphalism obscures. Um, that is, you know, the defeat of the Democratic Revolution of the Second Reconstruction, um, the counter-revolution resulting in debt, destabilization, assassinations, covert operations, domestic policing and surveillance, militarization of the southern border, the dismantling of the welfare state and the social wage, policies of privatization, austerity, and outsourcing. And I will conclude with some reflection on you know, what might require, what might be required, I should say, to end war, you know, to, to end exploitation, to end enclosure, and to decolonize. Okay, so let's see what I got. Actually, I want to show you that picture. I forgot about that picture. Um, and I want to show you this picture, although I don't talk about this picture. Um, when you see armed people who are white, they're usually defending liberty. When you see armed black people, <laughs> I had a whole thing about armed self-defense which I took out, uh, but we might talk about this. Like, you know, why certain people can get away with walking around with guns and others can't. Okay, so let's get to the heart of the matter. After World War II, the U.S. emerges as a preeminent global economy and military power, just as the European empires are collapsing and the non-aligned movement is seeking collective strategies to establish and maintain sovereignty among the new post-colonial nation-states. As, as a consequence, American hemispheric hegemony is now worldwide, leading to rapid expansion of U.S. militarism, investment, 
exploitation of raw materials in a cheap, disciplined labor force, as well as an opening for U.S. manufactured goods. So you have the Marshall Plan to direct, um, from, from the Marshall Plan to direct military intervention, the U.S. You know, then tries to turn the world into a master free market, and that's the goal at the end of World War II. But the U.S. can't do it. They have several obstacles in the way before they can actually achieve this goal of turning the world into its own master free market. One of those uh, obstacles is communism. And not just the Soviet Union, um, but Cuba, uh, China. Um, and it's interesting because, um, uh, you know, not just the Soviets, but who, who are actually interested in their own national security, but the strength of communist parties around the globe as well. Uh, this is another story which we can get into, but even in Europe, where uh, places like Italy and France, where the communist parties were becoming mass organizations um, after the war. Now, why is that? Why, why was there an upsurge in communism, despite you know, what we see in hindsight as the crimes of the Soviet Union, the crimes of Stalin, the, um, the violation of sovereignty? The reason is because most European countries and local communists were actually the heads or very active in the anti-fascist resistance. And they won support and legitimacy that way. Um, secondly, you have the, the uh, emerging third world nations as an obstacle. As Vijay Prashad uh, demonstrates, the new leaders wanted sovereignty. And after decades or even centuries of colonial rule, many tried to rebuild their economies on social democratic or socialist lines. Some, in some cases, they resisted transnational corporations and U.S. dominations, um, various efforts to liberalize their economies, and as a consequence of that resistance, they faced overt or covert wars, assassinations, and the like. Um, you can mention Iran, you can mention Guatemala, you can mention Indonesia, the Congo, is a long, long list. These military, financial, and political wars on the third world and on the working class, remade the global economy by producing refugees and low-wage immigrant labor for the U.S. economy, opening these countries to liberalization, and also fueling the expansion of, of the national security state by establishing bases around the world, you know, bases a part of the U.S. economy, building prisons within the United States, and in all of which constitutes a key segment of the economy. Now, tragically, but not surprisingly, uh, the leaders of U.S. organized labor, uh, notably people like George Meany and Lane Kirkland, actively supported U.S. imperialist policies. They supported U.S. intervention and other policies that undermined the condition of workers in third world countries. Which brings me to the third obstacle that U.S. capital had to remove, and that is a militant U.S. labor force. After the war, U.S. industry was racked by a national strike wave, 1945 and 46. Uh, wildcat strikes without union approval, a whole range of strikes. And anti-communism was used not only to crush the strikes, but to dismantle the left-wing unions that pushed for civil rights, protections of immigrants uh, and immigrant workers, and expanding democracy. And one of the weapons in that war, that domestic war on labor, uh, was the passage of Taft-Hartley, Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which undermined and even criminalized the use of strikes, boycotts, and, as well as restricted the freedom of speech um, and limited the capacity of trade unions to participate in politics. The other weapon was um, the McCarran-Walter uh, uh, Act, the, known as the McCarran-Walter Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1952. Now, while on the one hand, uh, the McCarran-Walter Act abolished racial restrictions on naturalization laid out in the original Naturalization Act of 1790, on the other hand, it imposed strict quotas, creating racial and ethnic preferences for white immigrants. Most importantly, it tightened and expanded political exclusions, people deemed politically dangerous, like you know, communists, socialists, uh, labor agitators, quote-unquote sexual deviants, uh, were now more easily exported and uh, denied entry. And it's here that we begin to see the increased militarization of the Southwest border. I mean, sometimes we think of this as a, uh, a product of the more recent war on drugs, but it really goes back to the immediate post-war period. In fact, the militarization of the border is part of um, Eisenhower's national security doctrine. So in 1954, 
Pat McCarran uh, declared that, quote, communist agents were among the wetbacks, you know, who crossed the Rio Grande, uh, which became part of the ideological justification for what was known as Operation Wetback the same year. And that is a mass deportation campaign in which Mexican workers under the Bracero program were rounded up and repatriated to Mexico. And of course, the truth is, Operation Wetback wasn't about national security at all. It was an attempt to discipline one segment of the labor force, that is, the Mexican-American, uh, Mexican uh, segment working in canneries and mines and factories, uh, and appease and discipline another segment of the labor force, and that is the naturalized U.S. labor force in unions, to get behind protectionist efforts of the nation, to mobilize nationalist sentiment, to support interventionist policies abroad under the guise of anti-communism and the like. Now, taken together, all of these policies and actions, you know, the conditions, you know, opened the door for dismantling the Keynesian warfare state and establishing the architecture of neoliberalism. Now, neoliberalism represents an escalation of the world war on the working class that I talked about yesterday. And, and its labor policies entail several things. Not just labor policies, more to it, but here's just a few. One, um, it's about maximizing profits by driving down labor costs through outsourcing. Um, it's about exploiting unprotected foreign labor, weak unions, uh, imposing or weakening unions, imposing free trade policies in tandem with austerity measures. Um, two, it was about dismantling uh, the welfare state, deregulation, and the eroding um, government protections for the most vulnerable. By the way, it wasn't about smaller government. That's a big myth. It's about government doing certain things. Um, we could talk about that. Three, it also called for revolutionizing monetary, fiscal, and financial policies as a means of promoting unregulated free market activity, which includes using debt to restructure the governments of other nations. And then four, um, expanding the national security state, by which I mean the military, covert operations, domestic policing and surveillance, prisons, and a militarized border. And by the way, I don't say much about prisons today. We know so much about the expansion of the prison population that it, it, it should be taken as a given. Um, of course, the expansion of the punitive state is you know, certainly undergirded by moral panics that fuel law and order policies, especially the war on drugs. So we just take you know, one at a time. Third world debt. Um, all of these policies, at least the first three sets of policies, were behind the third world debt crisis, which was exacerbated in 1981 when uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, Secretary Paul Volcker decided to shock the U.S. economy out of inflation by raising interest rates astronomically. And this, of course, affected the whole globe, which then, uh, you know, forced a lot of governments like Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Venezuela to go into default. Now, countries could barely afford to pay the service on the debt, and I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of numbers, but let me just give you one, because I think it's, it's just so shocking to me that you just have to hear it. Between 1980 and 2002, the developing countries made uh, $4.6 trillion in debt payments. This represents eight times what they actually owed at the beginning of the period. So at, the, at 1980, they owed about $580 billion, but they made $4.6 trillion in debt payments. And after that, they still owed $2.4 trillion. Now, if you bought a house with that kind of interest, you, you know, you, you'd have to sue somebody. Um, now, the U.S. government and the IMF stepped in to restructure the debt, uh, paying off private banks first uh, and imposing structural adjustment policies. And you always have to remember that uh, for all the talk of austerity, a structural adjustment is the beginning, the front line of austerity, in, not in the West, but in the third world countries. Um, and of course, this meant devaluing the current currency, imposing wage freezes or reductions, privatizing public assets like water, mines, electricity, uh, radical cuts to social service spending, uh, removing subsidies on essential commodities like rice, heating oil, and bread, 
um, opening the economy to foreign ownership and allowing them to take profits out of the country. And this is where I think you know, Vijay Prashad makes a really, I think, uh, important critique of David Harvey, whose work is, I think, a, Brilliant, but in his you know sort of brief history of neoliberalism, it sort of begins in the U.S. But yet all these policies don't have to be experimented in the U.S. They're already being experimented in, in the so-called third world. So I think that's very important. And of course, what do these policies do? They drive workers out and drive foreign capital in. The militarization of the border. The Immigration Act of 1965 actually restricted Mexican immigration for the first time in U.S. history. At the very moment when global policies were generating more immigrants in search of jobs, and when restructuring of U.S. capital you know, was looking for cheaper labor abroad and at home. Now some of the immigration, especially from Central America of course, were products of political violence death squads backed by the U.S., uh, but by the mid-1970s, under Ford and Carter, we witnessed an increase in border patrol, uh, joint operations with armed forces, uh, the infusion of military technology, and the construction of a border wall. And I think it's important because, you know, we think of, of this as a kind of Reaganite or right-wing uh, thing, but even under Carter, you have this militarization of the border taking place. Um, which is exactly what we mean by neoliberalism. There's no party. <laughs> Neoliberals are not Republicans. <laughs> They're everybody. You know who has power in that sense. Okay, in any case, under Reagan, the U.S. massively increased uh, funding for border patrols, established more detention centers and checkpoints. And of course, with the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, among other things, it transformed the Border Patrol into D agents, in other words, into drug enforcement agents. Um, so they had kind of a dual role. Now, border militarization, in effect, criminalized migration and brought us the common language of the illegal alien. And as Lisa, Lisa Cacho reminds us, all the immigration reform and DREAM Acts in the world will not change or decriminalize what has become the permanent rightless status of the illegal alien. Okay, as long as you have the existence of the illegal alien, you always have a state of exception. And that's what, you know, some of these, some of this legislation is about creating exceptions for some, but still criminalizing others. Um, finally, free trade zones. Now, we have to be mindful of the fact that liberalization was the consequence of war. It wasn't the consequence of free markets. And by war, I mean military and economic war. You can just look at the record of U.S. intervention to see that. I talked about that yesterday, but it continues. The creation of free trade zones, or the model of free trade zones, uh, really begins with Puerto Rico, with the U.S. colony of Puerto Rico. Uh, besides exploiting the land for cheap sugar and prohibiting the island from entering into its own trade agreements, Puerto Rico became the test case for U.S. Uh, free trade policies across Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, right after World War II, the U.S. introduced Operation Bootstrap, converting the island into an export processing zone by the assembly of finished manufactured products for, the US, for U.S. firms. And in many ways, Operation Bootstrap represented the first application of the Maquiadora strategy, and, and the outcome, of course, was the same. That is, declining wages, precarity, um, terrible working conditions. Now, Operation Bootstrap you know, was eventually disbanded, but it set the stage for um, the better known border industrialization program in northern Mexico, which was responsible for the first wave of Maquiadoras. And these these firms uh, were by raw materials. Uh, these are firms whereby raw materials and components are imported into Mexico duty free, processed and assembled by poorly paid Mexican labor, and then exported to markets in developed countries, primarily the U.S., with a very small uh, value added tax assessed on the finished product. Now, you could ask the question: Well, what makes free trade zones free? What makes them free, what makes them attractive to U.S. To capital, period, is that they operated outside of the law 
in some ways. And what I mean by that is they operated outside of the host country's existing labor and environmental regulations, which allowed for the routine use of child labor, anti-union repression, the lack of clean water, or basic institutions like schools, all surrounded by industrial toxic waste. And the result was lower wages, industrial slums, greater poverty, and of course, more immigration to the US, which they claim the free trade zones are supposed to stanch that, but actually it produces even more immigration. Same can be said about you know, the Reagan administration's Caribbean Basin Initiative, which I'm not going to talk about, and we could talk about NAFTA as well. We could talk about it in discussion if you want to, but it's basically the same story. Um, the Caribbean Basin Initiative uh, turned the Caribbean into like the leading export of manufactured textiles, where women, almost all female labor, making like 26 cents an hour. You know, For a lot of the clothes that some of you are wearing, by the way, I know nothing I have on is sweatshop labor, by the way. I know that for a fact. And if you don't believe me, you can come look at my labor. Um, okay, finally, um, liberalization, free trade, freedom, ironically has actually spawned the expansion of modern slavery okay, and other forms of peonage. Uh, the International Labor Organization estimates that uh, something like 12.3 million people um, each year are taken captive and used as forced labor in inhuman conditions. And you have to you know, recognize that almost all of these cases of labor are mobile displaced labor. In other words, the conditions that created immobility are the conditions that made them vulnerable to slavery. Um, and you know, we see this certainly in the sex trade, which is one of the biggest uh, users of uh, slave labor. You see it in domestic servants, um, in you know, the, the, the field of domestic uh, labor. You see it among farm workers, who are sometimes kept in work camps um, or compounds protected by armed guards. And this is happening everywhere, including Western Europe. I mean, there are some Western European countries like France, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, and uh, the UK, uh, that where you could find examples of slave labor. And by one estimate, by one ILO estimate, something like 20% of the agricultural produce, pro agriculture produced in Europe was produced by slave labor. Okay? And I don't mean just slave wages, I mean they're not being paid, they're being held in bondage. Uh, now Silvio Federici, great theorist, thinker, historian, um, I think correctly characterizes neoliberal policies as an assault on women who bear the burden of keeping their families alive on wage and unpaid labor. In other words, what Marx, what Marx would call the reproduction of labor. Um, the loss of land and natural resources through dispossession and privatization in structural adjustment policies, you know, cutting health care, infrastructure, education, has increased the work and workday for women, especially in the Global South. It's also led to the expansion of homework uh, due to de the deconcentration of industrial production. It's forced more women into precarious, mobile, often unfree global labor market. Uh, it is, uh, you know, arranging domestic work and that sort of childcare. Uh, and under these conditions, uh, violence against women and sexual assault has risen exponentially. Uh, now, radical feminists have long revealed the relationship between militarism, policing, incarceration, and domestic violence, and feminists of color in particular have shown how racism you know, structures institutional responses to sexual assault and violence against women and transgender people. And I just point to Beth Ritchie's um, really amazing book, Arrested Justice, uh, where she, you know, she reveals that you know, we're saddled with a system that simply locks men up, punishes women for deviating from uh, heterosexual nuclear family norms, um, there's gender normativity, strips them of uh, a social safety net, and it never addresses seriously sexual violence and its victims. She offers a searing critique of the limits of turning to the state to deal with these forms of violence. Um, and it's interesting because as, as I talked about reconstruction, where domestic violence, other forms of sexual violence, 
um, and again, domestic is a tricky term here, but where sexual violence was something that women demanded should be uh, the role of the state to protect them from these forms of violence. And what she's saying is that you know, the, the state is compromised, and this is why. Um, uh, she's, you know, she basically says the state doesn't know how to deal with these forms of violence, not only because it further expands the prison uh, population, um, and the behaviors associated with caging human beings, but as she writes, it, quote, precludes the development of a sustained critique of the state's role in causing, complicating, and being complicit with male violence against black women. As a result, state-sanctioned violence that uh, women experience, uh, you know, a, a critical layer of harm is beyond reproach, you know. Um, okay, so I'm... I skipped a bunch of stuff here because I actually want to get to my longish conclusion and have more time for a discussion. So um, I just want to, again, remind you that everything that I say is provisional. Um, you can't hold me accountable to everything. You know, I, I will argue on behalf of my position, but I don't really, um, I'm not in a position where I'm, I'm, I'm like committed to every single thing I'm saying, nor does this represent everything I'm thinking. It just represents a fraction of my thinking. And a lot of the ideas, uh, both in my conclusion and also the way I kind of structured this talk, are completely new, like as of the last few days. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I had the, a great opportunity to, to visit another country just a few days before I came here uh, to take part in what was really intense discussions about, um, about capitalism. And I don't want to go into any details, but it's so interesting to have conversations about capitalism in the state and all these things outside of the United States where you get to hear and see perspectives that are completely different. And so some of my ideas actually are, are a result of these debates I was having. Um, so again, forgive me if it's not like smooth, if it's not eloquent, um, but you know, as, as uh, Josh said, um, I, I'm not really worried about my brand, <laughs> you know. So I didn't even know I had a brand. Okay. <clears throat> so Mike Brown was a casualty of war. Let's see. Actually, I'll leave that up there. I like that picture. He died at the hands of an employee of the state whose salary and uniform and vehicle and bullets Mike Brown's family helped to pay for. This was no mistake, no act of misrecognition, no violation of police policy or code. This was just another day in the modern world, collateral damage in perpetual war whose colonial roots are still alive. As Nelson Maldonado Torres so eloquently puts it, quote, in modernity, the racialized others take the place of enemies in a perpetual war out of which modern ideals of freedom and autonomy get their proper sense. This is the foundation of modernity as a paradigm of war and the source of many of its pathologies, crises, and evils. Coloniality is a spinal cord, as it were, of the modern paradigm of war. And I would also add to that that coloniality and capitalism are inseparable. And indeed, you can make the argument um, that colonialism has proven to be the most dominant and pervasive mode of production in the world. What I've tried to demonstrate over the past three days is that every effort to use the master's tools, the presumably uh, democratic state, to overturn the paradigm, to establish an ethical and just polity in which all people are accorded status as humans and sovereignty uh, and the commons are respected, was crushed. We can no longer expect the very state, the very legal edifice that continues to reproduce our conditions to provide the solution or be the arbiter of justice. This should not be startling, you know, it's not a startling conclusion and it's certainly not a new idea, you know, read Bakunin. Peter Kropotkin, who my daughter actually hit me to. Um, oh, I said I wasn't going to acknowledge you. I'm sorry. Um, 
my brilliant daughter, Eliza. Uh, this should be really the starting conclusion, you know. I'm sorry, this should, this should I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, so this is not a new idea. Uh, Chickasaw scholar Jordi Bird points to a fundamental contradiction in that, quote, human rights and equal rights and recognitions are predicated on and arbitrated by um, the very systems that propagate and maintain the dispossession of indigenous peoples to the common good of the world. Now, in the face of persistent colonial war, what choice is there but decolonization? Okay. And what does this mean? Uh, Fanon writes, decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder. Okay? Complete disorder. But it cannot uh, come as a result of magical practices or of a natural shock, nor of a friendly understanding. Decolonization, as we know, is a historical process. That is to say that it cannot be understood, it cannot become intelligible, nor clear to itself, except in the exact measure that we can discern the movements which give it historical form and content. Now, most of us take you know, the rest of that chapter on, on concerning violence in the wretched of the earth, we take from that chapter the idea of the necessity of violence, and violence as a cleansing force, which is the way Fanon is almost always read. But instead, I guess, I see the dismantling of the killing machine, the militant resistance to social death, the necessary life-taking, no, I'm sorry, necessarily life-taking, but uh, a call for a revolutionary act of love. So let me just repeat that, because actually I missed a little article. So I see the, the dismantling of the killing machine, the militant resistance to social death, um, not necessarily life-taking. So it doesn't require life-taking. But a call for, for a revolutionary act of love. That's how I read it. In Algeria in 1960, armed resistance and sabotage was an appropriate response to a settler colonial state, outnumbered and weakened by global forces, and always precarious despite its myths about it, itself. In the United States, where the structure of colonial domination is completely shrouded in liberal multiculturalism, neoliberal homilies about freedom, colorblind discourse that undergirds criminalization and white supremacy, enabling 400 years of state-sanctioned uh, serial murder to continue with impunity, power cannot be unseated through violence. The power cannot be unseated through violence. I don't think that's the case. Of course, you know, the very word I used here, impunity, reveals a contradiction in that the point of law for the colonized is not protection but containment. You know, it's not defense but discipline and in some cases genocide. In all of my talks, I tried to show that every struggle to end war was also an effort to restore forms of law and order that could bring the colonizer to justice, to actually recognize and hold him accountable for crimes against humanity. We continually turn to the very state apparatus, the crime weapon, to appeal for justice. And sometimes movements actually make progress and you know, molding and retrofitting the state in the service of reform. I'm not going to deny that. Um, sometimes it, it works in a redistributive capacity, even protecting uh, workers' interests. I'm not going to deny that. But as much as it shifts and grows and changes, it cannot be held. I know this appears to be kind of a pipe dream, but it's worth considering the ideas of M.A. Césaire and Leopold Senghor, which I appreciated Josh bringing up Césaire, um, who proposed alternative visions of governmentality that sought to dislodge a colonial state. And, um, and here I'm thinking about Gary Wilder's really excellent new book called Freedom Time, Negritude, Decolonization, and the Future of the World, which kind of shocked me. Um, I learned a lot I just did not know. Uh, what he does is he resurrects their post-nationalist vision. Um, they sought forms of association between the former colonies and France that would explode the existing national state from within. In this model, he writes, legal pluralism, disaggregated sovereignty, and territorial disjuncture would be constitutionally grounded. 
the presumptive unity of culture, nationality, and citizenship would be ruptured. And moreover, um, decolonization would actually you know, tr uh, transform the metropole. That was the vision. That decolonization wasn't just about the colonized spaces, but about the metropole itself. So decolonization was a global process that especially had to decolonize the colonizer. Um, and it would also you know, create a centralized, or decentralized, I should say, democratic federation based on a socialist economy. In spite of Senghor's own actions, which are very problematic, he believed that, at least he wrote down, that a socialist decolonization could never succeed unless revolutionizing the metropole. In other words, it's sort of like the argument about socialism in one country. You can't have socialism in the periphery without socialism in the metropole. That, and you can't have a transformation of class relations in the periphery without the same in the metropole. That was the argument. And, you know, and it's, it's quite profound, even if his own policies didn't actually come close to that. Now, there are many reasons why their vision was never taken seriously, or never considered, partly because there was no social movement behind their aims. And for most of the colonized world, political independence was the first and necessary step to sovereignty. Okay? But under such an arrangement, neocolonialism you know, might have been, and again, this is a question, might have been impractical, if not impossible. Because there would be you no know, undocumented, there would be no sans papier you know, in that cir circumstance. Um, building on Fanon, Du Bois, Aimé Césaire, Senghor, as well as numerous contemporary scholars, Emma Perez, uh, Walter Mignolo, uh, Ramon Grossfogel, uh, Jody Bird, um, and others I already talked about in this uh, presentation. I want to suggest that uh, liberi liberatory politics in our neoliberal era might be built on a concept of decolonial democracy. Now, proponents of the decolonial option tend to see uh, the decolonial option as an alternative to democracy or against democracy. Um, and I kind of resist that, op that opposition, and let me tell you why. Because the position them in opposition uh, excludes you know, the idea that the colonized, the enslaved, the dispossessed could be authors or had authored forms of democracy that carry a core decolonial vision. In other words, you can't talk about reconstruction without those former enslaved people being authors of a new mode of democracy, a new way of thinking, a new vision that had within it a core decolonial vision. It also assumes that democracy only begins in Europe, which erases the US appropriation of, say, the Iroquois understandings of the Constitution and Confederacy. Decolonial democracy requires the abolition of all forms of oppression and violence. It means disbanding the army, opening the prisons, freeing the body from the constraints of inherited and imposed normativities. It also is about making life, ending precarity. The nation state is incapable of doing this. I will not say it is an artifact or a relic of the past because that would assume a stadial view of history. It is an historical fact, an historical product, and it will not be dislodged easily or anytime soon. But the nation state has become the barrier and has always been, even when, in the best of times, we've been able to momentarily establish some control could steer the beast in the direction of making life. But we cannot remove its coercive function without abolishing the state itself. We must continue to fight the indiscriminate killing of us, whether by assault rifle, drone, or starvation. But we also need to continue to build community based on the values of cooperation, mutuality, nonviolence, equality, and love. That's, those are decolonial values, to be sure. Gracie Boggs constantly told us, we need to take governance and production into our own hands. We build our crumbling cities, but we cannot remake the commons or seize the commons without dismantling the state. I don't believe we can survive on the basis of dual power unless we can match the course of power of the state. And this is their raison d'etre, so that's not possible. If I claim to know how we could do this, then my historian card or my credentials as a dialectical thinker ought to be revoked. Okay? I don't know how. Movement, struggle will determine the future. All I know 
is that this war must come to an end. And that requires destroying the state as we know it, the carceral state, the military state, all forms, and creating new forms of governmentality that are about loving each other. Thank you. Okay, so I'm ready. Ready as I can ever be. Thank you. Got to take my glasses off because I can't see. So, questions, comments, arguments? Yes? Oh, Imani. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, Michael. I can't even see. Okay. Hey, Robin? Yes. Yes, so um, just, just to throw this out there. Um, I'm thinking about the internal colony thesis and the sort of echoes of it in mm -hmm. your talk and just wonder if you could expand on it a little bit and, and its attempt in some ways to fuse what you, you fused in your talk, this relationship with colonialism, empire, and the metropolitan state. Right. Oh, that's an excellent question. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't finish Althusser last night. I was, you know, it was... <laughs> um, Yes, the internal colonialism thesis, that idea that somehow, um, which is actually a quite profound analysis, that you know, um, inside the United States of America and elsewhere, but here's the U.S., there are um, uh, you know, racialized subjects, black people, um, Mexicans, indigenous peoples, that, that blacks and, and, and Mexicans in particular, and of course Puerto Ricans are direct colonies, colonies, colonial subjects, that they represent a kind of internal colony in the United States. Um, there's been various manifestations of that politically. The idea that, um, uh, that the, black, the, Com the Communist Party said, you know, black people in the South have a right to self-determination because they're kind of an internal colony. Um, they, they even took a similar position about the Southwest and the Latino population. Did they have a right to self-determination and succeed even in the 1940s? Um, and then, of course, moving to the 1960s with people like Robert Blauner, um, the sociologist who actually tried to develop that thesis um, more th with more theoretical refinement. And I actually think, um, you know, one of the, the prospects of opposition to internal colonialism is identification with other third world movements, that is the, the fact that you're not locked in to a national identity. Um, number two, uh, the fact that you don't, you don't have to sort of limit your claims to appealing to a kind of state for justice, but you make the demand in a case like the Republic of New Africa, for example, for the right to your land. You know, right to actually create your own state. Um, that's appealing. And it's very powerful, and I think that it, it gener it's very generative of new ideas. Um, but then I, I come back to Césaire and Senghor and to the question of um, how do you move to a place where you're moving towards the elimination of all boundaries and borders, um, where you move towards, uh, uh, you know, and a post-national position that may not be viable, but I think that you can't even get to a post-national position without going through that process of having a kind of national identity. That is, an identity that's not locked into the empire, that's not tied to it. Because the beauty of the internal colonialism thesis that enables people to break, to say, you know what, I'm not with your Cold War project. In fact, I'm not even you. And you actually constitute the oppressor, and you're part of the empire. And an anti-imperialist analysis comes out of that directly. Um, and finally, one thing I, I really like about the, the way in which internal colonialism was, was expressed and articulated in the late 60s, early 70s, um, as much as it was associated with nationalism, I think that when you actually read you know, people like members of the Black Panther Party and others, they, were, they weren't exactly nationalists in the sense that they were more like third world liberationists not claiming to be a part of a cultural nationalist. Um, identity, but something that was much more um, based on solidarity and broader, like that. So, I think that helps. Okay, I know. Um, so, my, my question begins with um, how you talk about indigeneity mm -hmm. and, and trying to sort of, for me, trying to connect that to um, 
neoliberalism in, in Latin America in particular, and thinking about um, the layers of what it means to be a colonized subject, right? right? So that indigenous people still sub is still subjugated exactly. throughout Latin America, and then though coming as citizens, right, of that particular nation state in the United States and experiencing another kind of colonial relationship. Um, and the layers of that um, made me want to sort of ask you about how you think about um, what neoliberalism does to us as people. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean so that you may have, you have these moments in many nations where there is a kind of investment in this as a project and then sort of in, in pulling back in parts of Latin America. Um, and yet, and, and yet still experience a kind of subjugation vis-a-vis -vis the United States in, even in that. And so, um, Dardo and Laval talk about how neoliberalism creates us a kind of entrepreneurial citizenship. It gets into us, it shapes how we right. think of who we are. Right. And I also thought about this because someone I know on Facebook was complaining, who works at a call center, is complaining about McDonald's workers wanting $15 an hour because they don't deserve that because he works much harder, right? Because he's actually getting, he's broke, but getting money from other broke people for this right. larger company, right? And that was right, more right. noble work. And so, how. All of this shapes who, what kinds of people, we, what, how we think of who we are, right? Um, um, interferes with the sort of, I don't know, liberation right. vision, right? In a way that I think is in some ways unprecedented. I mean, the way in which it has gotten into people's very self-conception. Right, right, right. That, that's an excellent question. There's actually, there's another part of the question I, I'm, I actually want to answer, which wasn't a question, but it was about your friend in McDonald's, which I know all about McDonald's, um, having worked there, but um, it's interesting that the, the first really um, visionary and, uh, and sophisticated critique of neoliberalism comes from the Zapatistas. That's the source, right? And that's not an accident. Uh, where you have a group of indigenous peoples you know, whatever you might say about Comandante Marcos and whether or not he's indigenous, the fact is that he articulated a position among the Zapatistas that said that as indigenous peoples, you know, not, not just as, as Mexicans, but as indigenous peoples, we are suffering the brunt of the neoliberal um, policies that are coming from our state, let alone from the United States. And that part of those policies are not and seizing the commons, but it's about destroying a way of life. And so part of the idea of the decolonial turn is to say that there are cosmologies and ideologies and conceptions of the world that actually challenge um, not just neoliberal ideology, but coloniality itself. And that even some of the people in the name of the Bolivarian revolutions Right, in the name of those revolutions to say, you know, we are, we are moving towards a kind of revolutionary possibility, participate in the undermining and privatization of sources of life. And so that contradiction, I think you hit it right on the head, that is the fundamental contradiction. Um, and it's a contradiction that I think will be really interesting in future politics, uh, especially if um, North American U.S. Latino populations, particularly those of uh, Central American and Mexican descent, claim indigeneity. You know, because that would, I mean, a lot of them do, they, they do. I mean, most of them are actually are indigenous peoples, you know. Um, to do that would then say, okay, well, our struggles then have a, a different layer. Like, we talk about the layers. That's a different layer of thinking of, and I didn't get to this, um, I kind of cut it out, um, what what do the peasant rebellions and campesinos mean? Does it mean a relationship to production and to land, or does it mean a relationship to a culture? You know, and it's both. It's both of those things. So I think that's a very exciting prospect, uh, but it's also fundamental in the contradiction. If you compare a group like the Zapatistas with um, uh, the MST in Brazil, which is like the Landless People's Movement, um, they're much more sort of traditional Marxist, 
they, they include you know, urban workers and rural workers. They, they don't play up the indigenous elements of their work organ, organizing. And there's a cost for that. Um, because for them, it's playing down indigeneity, which produces the working class consciousness. It produces the universal, the universal, you know, and of course that's a, that's a challenge, that's a problem. Um, and here you got the Zapatista saying, look, you can ex respect and acknowledge our cultural traditions and join us. It's not exclusion. It's actually the incorporation of a new way of thinking. And so that the sources of ideas doesn't come from an analysis of the factors and forces of production, but comes out of certain kinds of cultural expectations and beliefs and dreams. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, choose a side, but that th these are the fundamental contradictions we're dealing with, and which is why I think more and more people are talking about kind of a decolonial option um, as a possible radical politics that could actually transcend and move beyond the Bolivarian politics that we, we saw, which is very exciting, but there may be something else going on. So. Um, oh, and the, the McDonald's thing. I just think it's amazing that we, and I think Lisa Cotter actually says this in her book, Social Death, that we have, the, one of the arguments uh, for treating quote-unquote immigrants well is to say that they're the ones who take the jobs nobody wants. This is the common discourse. This goes back to the gentleman's question yesterday, which I wanted to address. Um, and what does that mean? What it means that we've accepted the neoliberal logic, and not just neoliberal logic, it goes back to just basic, the basic kind of bourgeois logic that forms this particular part of the world that says um, that hard, dirty work ought to be low paid. That that's just a natural thing. You know? Like really? I mean, if, if I came from another planet and saw that, you know, a CEO is making like $500 trillion versus, you know, someone who actually is, is flipping burgers, let alone growing, growing the stuff that becomes the basis for our food, right, as consumers, I would be like, what kind of crazy world is this? You know? And I just love, if you ever see um, be the beautiful film, um, Finally Got the News, about, you know, the, uh, which, and of course Jordan uses it every year in his class, um, where this is a great moment where there's a guy talking about a man who's in mining. And he's like, mining? This person never got his fingernails dirty. He's in mining. You know, he's got, he's in mining. What does that mean? You know, but this is the logic that has to be overturned, you know. The logic that actually, um, it's not a zero work logic, but a, uh, it's one that turns, um, you know, that produces useful and fulfilling and beneficial work, you know, or labor. I should say, not working for someone, but you know, working. Anyway, I, that's too much information, but someone else had, okay, I promise it would be faster, yeah. So I have two interrelated questions. One is, in your um, vision of a borderless world, what kind of role, or w whether or not you see a role in, in your current thinking, uh, that technology might play, in particular the internet, in the creation of that kind of space? Uh, the related question then is about automization. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is specifically within the United, not just within the United States, but within the, but within the West. Right. Uh, there's been these discourses in the past really five years about automization as uh, almost inevitable uh, in the service industry and in the supply chain, right. and what that would do to the possibility of some sort of working class activism here in this country. Right. How old are you? 26. 26, okay. I ask that question because um, the, the conversation about automation mm -hmm. is old. Right, no, and I'm aware of that, but, right. but at the but same I mean, time, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking with particular driverless of, cars. No, no, but I'm saying, despite, despite I'm, I'm setting up this, um, it's very old, meaning that it really took off um, among a lot, well, it, it, it goes back to the 19th century. It goes back to, to Marx himself, who had this fetish for technology. His thing is, you know, future is about, in, you know, he loved the concept of efficient industrialization. I mean, had he been around at the time 
um, of Frederick Winslow Taylor, he'd be like, Taylor's a, you know, I'm off him. Antonio Gramsci, who's one of my favorite thinkers of all time. Antonio Gramsci um, was fascinated by Detroit and fascinated with Ford. And part of the reason why was the, um, the assembly line. He said, we'll make a new man. This is one of the things I disagree with. He says a new man will come out of that um, because it disciplines people. So the fascination among Marxists with technology is one in which automation was actually liberating. And then, uh, 1960s, you get all these interesting writing. James Boggs is writing about automation. Um, there's a wonderful, very important book that I would suggest everyone gets out of print called Who Needs a Negro? by Sidney Wilhelm. It's a classic. Um, it's been reprinted under a different title, but it's called Who Needs a Negro? The whole premise behind that book is that automation will replace black industrial labor. And you're going to get a redundant, unemployed, permanently unemployed class of people. And what we're going to see is something close to, whether it's, you're talking about incarceration or gender, something's going to happen, and you've got to be prepared for that. And so everyone was obsessed with automation. What's the outcome? The amazing thing is that forms of labor that have emerged, particularly in the neoliberal era, have been incredibly primitive because it's about cheap labor. If you can get cheap labor, if, cheap, if labor is cheaper than automation, you will go with cheap labor. Um, forms of farming, you know, though there's, autom there's, there's certainly mechanical you know, pickers and things like that, but low wage, cheap labor is, is the key because it's about, you know, pushing labor prices as low as possible, keeping prices of um, the productive forces as low as possible. On the other hand, there are places where automation actually does work. And what's interesting about so many of these examples, there's production, but there's also consumption. Automation about consumption is all about self-serve. It's all about, you know, you get your own money, you get your own food, you cook your own food, you, you know, you do, you know, all this stuff is going on where you can't find a labor force cheap enough to do that for you. But when you can, it will. Um, now, in terms of the future, I don't really know. All I know is that, uh, in terms of your first question about the border, and I'll kind of try auto tie automation to this, um, I don't have a clue, because by the time we ever get to a place where there'll be no borders, I don't know where the technology will be. I mean, you know, we may not even have people anymore, just everyone's a cyborg, um, which I hope that's not the case. But I, don't, I can't even guess what that means, but I do know that um, it's not just the elimination of borders, because there's a way in which um, the, the concept of elimination of borders can be easily incorporated by a neoliberal order. That's, in other words, it's not guaranteed that somehow eliminating borders is like a radical thing. It, and we, we already know that capital knows no borders. They have no passports, they just go wherever they want to go, right? Um, the question that we have to ask, and I'm not prepared to answer it, but it requires analysis, is what, is, what are the continuing functions of borders? How do they fun what do they do? Some things we know offhand, but some things we still need to know. Um, and why some borders and not others. Uh, and number one, number two, as long as there are borders, the forms of technology we're gonna deal with are forms that allow for you know, modes of communication, but also modes of surveillance. Because the whole point of a border is to protect, to, make, to block, and surveillance is one of those. So systems of surveillance is, is key. Um, finally, in terms of new technologies, uh, we are at a, an adorno moment, you know, in the sense that w what are the technologies that seem to be a most, um, uh, most advanced? They're war technologies. You know, I mean, the fact that everyone now has a drone and drones are delivering packages from Amazon or whatever, you know, they use cheap, terribly exploited labor in Amazon and they use machines to fly these things. We associate drones with terror, drones with violence, drones with war. You know, and that is sort of where we are, uh, where, you know, when, when Adorno says, you know, the history of, of, you know, human society is not, you know, the rise from barbarism to civilization, but the slingshot to the atom bomb, that destructive technologies, because militarism is dominating us, and part of ending war is ending militarism and ending the whole culture, because there's no reason why, as, you know, y'all at Princeton University, 
Does it make any sense to have bombs? It makes no sense. You all are the smartest people on the planet. And you know you can't accept that, right? It makes no sense at all to anyone to have bombs or guns. No? But anyway. Um, yes? Um, I just had a... You t talked the, the, the last few days um, in different moments about the potential of um, multiracial organizing mm -hmm. uh, in response to um, state violence, state terror, uh, in the post-Reconstruction era, and then the response to that um, is the, the, what did you, how did you refer to that? What, the counter-revolution right. um, of right. abolition uh, right. democracy. And then again, um, in the 19-teens and the 1920s, mm -hmm. and uh, then later with McCarthyism. And so I'm just wondering what you think about the prospects um, for the development of multiracial organizing and movement building in this particular moment, given what you've also described as um, the uh, continued buildup Right. Um, of the state and the the hardening of um, different aspects of the uh, re repressive apparatus mm -hmm. of the right. state. What do you think is 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 possible in terms of resisting that? Right. I would say that it's um, whether it's possible, it's necessary. That the the hardening the, the the what we're faced now in this neoliberal order in the kind of everyday violence that has become almost norm normative. I mean, the fact that we could sort of document this violence all the time is still sort of normative, um, means that um, any form of organizing, particularly forms of organizing that cross uh, certain ba barriers and boundaries are just necessary. Um, you know, I used to think about uh, the prospects in tactical and strategic ways. Like, what are the conditions that could lead to this? Um, and now I'm at the point where, um, in going back and kind of looking at at the movements I've been able to write about over my my privileged life, especially the Communist Party in Alabama. I just did a you know there's a four, a, a 25th anniversary edition coming out this year, and I wrote a new and I had to go back and reread that book. And what amazed me was that the conditions were not ripe. The conditions were not right for interracial organizing. There was, it was not. But they did it. And they did it because in those movements, it was black workers who took the lead. In the case of Reconstruction, they weren't ripe either. But it was black workers who took the lead. You know? And I'm not saying it's just black workers, but if, even if you take like Los Angeles, the groups that I end up working with, the Labor Community Strategy Center, it's Latino workers who are in the lead. It's Korean workers in the lead you know, of organizing. And when they can bring white people on, they bring them on. They approach them. They take the abuse. They argue. They struggle. Because they know it's necessary. And the kind of, and this thing, we never acknowledge the kind of sacrifices that it takes to actually do multiracial organizing. Because in most cases, it's not the white people doing it. I'm sorry. I hate to say it. It's not. They actually participate, but they're not the ones off, often at the lead of genuine multiracial organizing. And so I think it's necessary. And I think that, um, if anything, it's both multiracial and it's multinational and it's cross-border uh, organizing that is just fundamental and necessary. And then finally, um, there's got to be a way, and I, I ran out of time, and I, I'm crying about this, where we, because I had this whole thing about the, you know, domestic versus the public and the internal versus the external, where so much of our organizing and political work has to connect what we think of as the public sphere with what we think of as the private sphere. Because much in the private sphere, the violence that takes place in the, in the so-called private sphere is violence that is criminal and killing us and affecting us in many, many ways. The story of Michael Brown's death is a story that takes place on the streets, but in the homes of all those people, you know? And what's going on in their homes, and I'm not just talking about domestic violence, but just the violence that is meted out on people by virtue of want, 
you know, that that's organizing that we need to be able to do and not treat it as a social problem, but treat it as a political problem. That's part of what it means to say a decolonial democracy, to, to break that inside-outside division. That makes sense. So, Can we thank Robin, Dr. P Professor Robin thank Kelly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank, take this opportunity to thank you for, for attending the Toni Morrison Lectures this year. Next year, God willing, Wooly Soyinka will be the Toni Morrison Lecturer. Uh, I'd like to thank the faculty. I'd like to thank the staff. Can we give the staff a hand once again? <laughs> April, Dion, Allison, Elio. And really quickly, just to let you know, tomorrow uh, at 4.30 in Heinz Library, Gary Wilder. Uh, was just mentioned, will be given a talk entitled Freedom Time, Negritude, Decolonization and the Future of the World. Uh, also, uh, tomorrow at 7 o'clock, Black Trans Lives Matter. C.C. McDonald will be here. Um, and on April 20th, uh, sponsored by CAS as well, um, graduate affairs event will be hashtag black studies, digital age, race, digital media, and social networks that will be held in McCormick Hall 101. We welcome you to go to our website and look at all the activities that, that are taking place in CAS. Thank you once again and have a wonderful evening.